She's the first African American to be president of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Science, and she's the woman who could fire me at any moment. Please welcome Cheryl Bone Isaacs. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the fifth annual, sixth annual Governor's Awards, Scientific and Technical Awards. Everyone in the Hollywood community has a role to play in bringing about the vital changes the industry needs so that we can accurately reflect the world today. Along the hot, dusty Arizona road he came, to the edge of the desert. Homer Smith, the roving ex-GI who carried his home on four wheels. Got the scoot, he has sent to me a big, strong man. He didn't say anything to me about sending me any place. I was just passing by. Yeah. I brought you a present. Take it. Put them on. It's glasses. Not quite. They're sunglasses. There, just as I thought. What is it, Dr. Brooks? This man has stolen a scalpel. He's got it hidden on him. I want him searched. Hand it over, Biddle. I ain't got it, Doc. Are you sure there's one missing? I checked out three, Dr. Horton. We've only found two. He's had every opportunity to take it. Miss Blake and I had our backs to him most of the time. The scalpels were lying right here on the instrument table. And all he had to do was... I'm pleased to meet you, Mrs. Drayton. I take it Joanna's already busted out with the big news. Well, she has um, t told me a good deal, and all very quickly, too. Oh. She's only known me for 10 days, so she can't tell you when I'm blushing. <laughs> that could be another problem for us. You know? <laughs> <clears throat> Mrs. Drayton, I'm medically qualified, so I hope you wouldn't think it presumptuous if I say you ought to sit down before you fall down, I mean. He thinks you're going to faint because he's a Negro. Well, I don't think I'm going to faint. <clears throat> but I'll sit down anyway. My name is Cheryl Boone Isaacs, and I am currently the founding director of the Sidney Poitier New American Film School, located at Arizona State University. Prior to my appointment, I have spent many, many years in the entertainment business. I got excited about working in the film business when I was pretty young. I had a brother who was working in the film business, and we would drive down to New York to see the big films open. One of the big and first for me was West Side Story. And I learned all the songs. So by the time we drove to New York to go to the screening, I mouthed every word. And it was just great. I started in the film business in 1977. It intimidated me, but I thought, you know what? You gotta go for it. There were still challenges, you know, being a woman, being a minority. I didn't let that get in my way. My brother, Ashley Boone, who was definitely a pioneer in the world of film as a leading marketing and distribution executive, known for many, many things, but probably the one that everybody thinks about is his strategy for the opening of the very first Star Wars movie in 1977. 20th Century Fox presents the most extraordinary motion picture of all time, Star Wars. Here's where the fun begins. No legendary adventure of the past could be as exciting as this romance of the future. Here they come. May the Force be with you in Star Wars. And along the way, I have had uh, many mentors, such wonderful people as Ruben Cannon, a producer, uh, of course, the ever-lovable Spike Lee, Deborah Martin Chase, who I've had the wonderful opportunity of working with her, Deborah Lee from BET, 
Paris, Barclay was head of the DGA. Hema Washington was head of the Television Academy at the same time that I was president of the Film Academy. And that was definitely a first in this business. And it was certainly a time to be very, very proud of for all of us. Roger Ebert was the definitive mainstream film critic in American cinema. You give Benji the Hunter a positive review. That's totally unfair because you realize they almost didn't care what anyone else thought as long as they could try to persuade the other. My name is Chaz Hamilsmith Ebert and I'm the CEO of Ebert Digital and the Ebert Companies, which among other things, publish one of the preeminent movie review sites, RogerEbert.com, and I'm the president of the Roger and Chaz Ebert Foundation. Page views are up by about 2.5%. One of the things that we're doing, and this is a project Roger and I started together, is we are building the Roger Ebert Center at the University of Illinois in the College of Media. And the purpose and the mission of the Ebert Center will be to educate and inspire emerging writers and filmmakers to make movies that matter. I co-founded the Ebert Fest Film Festival at the University of Illinois in Champaign, where I give a humanitarian award to films that exhibit unusual compassion. Some of the documentary films I have supported as an executive producer are primarily concerned with these principles, or that of social justice. We're all of us passing for something or other. Aren't we? Black seeds keep on growing. There's nothing but evolution and monsters. They are still here. Manly! Go! And I think everybody watching and listening should know that, uh, you know, Chaz already said about Nell, but we have to say that about you, Chaz, mm -hmm. that you are constantly creating openings, your Women's Writers Week, your Black Writers mm -hmm. Week. Um, yeah. The films that you make, uh, the most beautiful thing uh, oh, in the story. Oh. I love that film. I started my career as an attorney after I graduated from the DePaul College of Law in Chicago, Illinois. One of my top role models for my practice of law was Justice Thurgood Marshall. What I say is that I have faith in the efficiency of the law. Perhaps that is because I'm a lawyer, not a missionary. My other role model when I was a young lawyer was Jewel Stratford Le Fontant, who in 1946 was the first African-American woman to graduate from the University of Chicago Law School. She later became the first African-American female and actually the first female to be appointed Deputy Solicitor General of the United States. I was a rarity, if not an oddity. There had never been a woman, black or white, Deputy Solicitor General of these United States. But I also want to pay tribute to my very first role model, my mother, Mrs. Johnny May Hamill. She was quite simply a goddess to me. And when she walked into a room, she brought the sunshine with her. And in her 85 years on this earth, I don't remember her saying many negative things about people or situations. One of my current role models is Oprah Winfrey, who famously rose above a troubled childhood attendant with trauma to become one of the most philanthropic people on this earth. You cannot spend your life with your gallon size offerings, offering them to pint sized people. You have got to surround yourself with gallon sized people who can hang in the same company with you so that you're not offering your gallons to those little pints out there who can't hold it anyway. My name is Ruben Cannon. The way I would describe myself as a veteran uh, television, film, entertainment expert. And the legacy that I'm most proud of in my career are, are the young people whose career I was able to give a boost to. That's what I'm most proud of. I mean, we currently have a vice president in the Disney organization, have another vice president over at Fox. I mean, throughout the industry, it's because I was the first black casting director in the industry. I made a point to make sure I wouldn't be the last. Which is, being involved with so many talented creative people. You know, I was there at the launch of the Oprah Winfrey. And welcome to the very first National Oprah Winfrey Show! I 
was casting the color purple, so that that formed a friendship with Oprah. Hell no. What did she say? Hey, can't you pump that crude a little faster? Gail, what did you say to Miss Millie? I said, hell. <gasps> oh, Miss Sophia. We did that friendship became also a business partnership where I produced the women of Brewster Place with her. Seems to me there's a lot of things nature don't prepare us for. Yeah. It's like them two girls Miss Sophie's about to fry her brains over. She ought to be glad they that way. That's one less bed she got to worry about pulling Jess out of. I started working with Tyler Perry in 2005. What was, I thought would be one film, uh, which was Diary of a Mad Black Woman. Tyler Perry's Diary of a Mad Black Woman. I'm placing you under house arrest. You ain't finna put me on no house arrest. It's either that or prison. I take the house arrest. Was the beginning of a 10 film production and 265 episodes of television. I was able to just see a talented young man <clears throat> offer my experience and expertise, staff the company, and just watch him grow. Tyler didn't have any experience in working in Hollywood, and I did, and some of, my, some of the Hollywood protocols and Hollywood uh, systems, well, Tyler had never seen that model, but he knew the model he knew was based on theater. When he was on the road doing his plays, they did eight shows a week. The difference between a half hour sitcom and a three act play or two act play, very similar to actors. So if we can do eight shows a week in the theater, granted it's the same play, why can't we do three or four episodes or, or at least one a day or two, one every other day of a, of a half hour sitcom? So we tried it and it worked. So, you know, th that was a lesson that I learned that what was maybe Hollywood had used the same model since Lucille Ball days about free camera, half hour sitcoms. There is another way to do this. And we see that now as we see Tyler with the largest studio in the country. My first 10 movies were all about her subconsciously, wanting her to know that she was worthy, wanting black women to know you're worthy, you're special, you're powerful, you're amazing. What happens when you're busy working at what you love to do, you don't think of it as making history, you don't think of it as creating a legacy, you just think of I'm just trying to be the best professional or be the best at what I do. So I'm very encouraged and very excited about the future of entertainment especially what, you know, what it means to people of color. Look at this beautiful runway. They have this here because I travel them on the airplanes every day. And I'm really getting scared to fly now. I was at LaGuardia's airport a few months back when this airplane skidded off the runway right into the East River. I was there when that happened. I was thinking, first of all, anybody stupid enough to get on an airplane with the flight number 5050 heard of flight 50 50 it's always flight 102 216 huh 50 50 they're telling you before you leave the gate 50 50 now go out there on runway 13 and give it your best shot huh? and hello everybody it's me crazy george wallace comedian george wallace here today with you on history makers now some history about me. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. My parents, Deacon George and Mary Lou Wallace. Let me tell you something, we're from Atlanta, Georgia, a little section called Linwood Park slash Johnsontown, if you know what that is. That's right, Lenox Square used to be a black neighborhood. My brother, one of the first pro-black golfers, George Tater Pie Wallace. Charlie has a driver. He's trying to get a big drive down that left side on this short dog leg to the left. History for me, wanting to be a comedian growing up listening to Red Fox. Christmas of 1930, our landlady got put out. <laughs> that was a poor Christmas. My dad went outside the house and shot the rifle and came back in the house and told all the kids, Santa Claus just committed suicide. <laughs> Jackie, Mom's Mabley. Ladies and gentlemen, meet Mom's Mabley. <laughs>
I'd like to tell you, moms, it's just great having you on our show tonight. Honey, and it's great being on your show. <laughs> oh, yes, I enjoy listening to you and your dumb brother. <laughs> judge, pick me and mark him. Here come the judge. Pick up the judge. Pick up the judge. Gregory, we just laughed when we saw black people come on TV. That was some history for us. I never thought I'd see today that this thing would get so mellow that white folks would start asking me to comment on white folk problems. <laughs> I came back in from Europe last month, CNN. Uh, Mr. Gregory, you think uh, we'll ever catch Ben Loudon? I say, we. Oui. I ain't looking for him. I'm still trying to find out who my daddy is. I want to thank God for people like them. Pay, pave the way for me and others. So I'm here in Las Vegas. I'm also known as the new Mr. Vegas because of those people that paved the way for me. Please welcome the godfather of comedy, George Wallace. Come on, make some more noise. This is Las Vegas, make some noise. This is Las Vegas. I love, don't you love Las Vegas? This is a great, it's a little too hot here, but it's good. You know, like it's 118 today, but you know with the wind chill factor, wind chill, the wind chill factor is down to like 102, so you have to grab a sweater, you know. But I love this city. And you know the phrase, what happens in Vegas? <laughs> 